Welcome back, everyone. A final talk in the 12th Annual Life Sciences and Society Program Symposium, the moment many of you have been waiting for, I'm sure. You all know why we're here. I won't introduce this yet again. But for the people who are here for the first time today and have not had a chance to hear the previous performances, I am going to bring back Daniel Crawford to talk about um, some of the compositions he's been doing and to do a little performance for you. All right, thank you. Um, so as many of you might have heard before, and as Dr. Shank just mentioned, um, my name is Dan Crawford. Um, I'm here from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I recently completed my undergraduate studies at the U of M um, in geography and environmental sciences. And while I was there, I did have the opportunity to work very closely with a professor of mine to turn climate data into climate music. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. It is called A Song of Our Warming Planet, and um, as some of you may have already heard, um, each note in this piece is going to represent um, the temperature for a year in the climate record averaged across the entire globe. And this data comes from the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and it goes back to 1880, and at this point, the data that I'm performing go through 2014. Um, it's on my docket to add the new note for this year, but um, I get the impression you can imagine what that one might sound like. Um, and as I'd also like to take the opportunity as well just to offer my sincere gratitude to Dr. Shank and the Life Sciences and Society program, um, as well as the Mizzou community at large for offering me the opportunity to be here. It's been a fantastic experience and um, been able to interact with some wonderful people, so I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, and, you know, as has been reiterated in many of the talks that we've heard here throughout these past few days, the issue of climate change is an issue that's very much real, but at the same point, it's an issue that many of us struggle to communicate effectively because we as scientists, we rely on maps, graphs, and numbers, and we can put up all the hockey stick shapes and all of the large numbers and the red um, areas on a map where it's been warming the most. But as we can see in society, there are still some folks who aren't getting the full picture from those kind of representations. So what Scott St. George and I have decided to do with uh, translating these data into music is to just try to offer another direct translation of these data that stay true to the scientific approach, but just to represent it in a different way that might allow people to, to hear these data rather than seeing them on a graph and maybe get a little bit different of an emotional or rational response to what we've been able to measure over our globe over the past 135 years. So once again, um, for the final time in this symposium, I'm pleased to perform for you 135 years of climate data on my cello called A Song of Our Warming Planet. And thank you again so much.
Now I'd like to bring up Catherine Reed from the MU School of Journalism to introduce our final speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Reed, an associate professor in the School of Journalism, and I'm pleased and honor, honored to be able to introduce um, our speaker. It's not every day that I have an opportunity to meet one of my heroes and say thank you in person for the work that that person has done. And in this case, we already got that out of the way in the ladies' room during the break. <laughs> Um, it's where all the important women are meeting. Um, Naomi Oreskes is a historian of science, a professor at Harvard, and a respected author. I'm sure you have some sense of why she is a big deal in the climate science world, but she's also a big deal in the science journalism world. And that's because of what she accomplished when she sat down and read, I, mean, I need to look at the number again. 928 published studies on climate change. That's a lot of reading. What she found surprised her, total consensus on the fact that global warming was in progress and that we humans were the cause. You wouldn't have known there was such consensus at the time because of how often the word debate was being, in being used in conjunction with the words climate change. Sometimes when the news media can't sort out the science and we're being spun, the result is a pretty bad thing called false balance. Dr. Oreskes took it another crucial step further. She pulled back the curtain on the machinery behind a very calculated and cynical disinformation campaign. She wrote an essay and then with co-author Eric Conway, the book Merchants of Doubt. A year ago, the documentary based on their book was released. I use that film now in teaching reporting because it shows how the media can become unwitting accomplices in creating confusion for the public about what the science is saying. Once you see how the spin works, you can't unsee it. And that's a good thing for us in the media and for news consumers. It's no exaggeration to say that everything is at stake in improving how we communicate science to the public and how we frame the problem. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of my personal heroes, Naomi Oreskes. Many years ago, I got invited to give a really great invited lecture at Brigham Young University. And when we arrived, this young woman runs up to me and throws her arms around me and says, I'm so excited to meet you because you're my hero. And I had my daughters with me on this particular trip. And my 13-year-old looks at me and she goes, Mom, you're someone's hero? <laughs> and then she says, and a Mormon? <laughs> so one of the great things about this work is I now have all kinds of friends in interesting places, people who I didn't expect to be friends with. Um, and I've learned a huge amount from all the people I've met. Um, the other story that's similar is, I like to show this, I like to start with the covers of the book so I can remind myself that I really did write this book and it really did sell a lot of copies, but also to acknowledge my great uh, and wonderful collaborator, Eric Conway, um, and to thank him, also to thank all of you for coming today, and to thank Mary Schenk and all the organizers and funders of this really terrific event. And I feel like I've learned a lot being here in the last two days, and I can't always say that about visits. I've worked on this issue a long time, and there, as Marshall said earlier today, there's not that many like, new questions that people ask, but it's really been an incredibly informative couple of days. So thank you all for that. But the other thing I like to, the other reason I like to put up, this is the uh, cover of the Australian edition of Merchants of Doubt. And when this came out, I had it sitting on the front, on the uh, table. And this time, my other daughter, who at the time I think was 15, uh, looked at this and she goes, so I don't know if you can read this in the back, but this is from the West Australian, the largest newspaper in Perth, Australia. And they called the book a sizzling page turner. And my teenage daughter looked and she goes, life must be very boring in West Australia. <laughs> so you know, you take the praise where you can get it. All right, well, I'd like to start with good news. This is a bit of a depressing topic, so I'd like to start with good news. Then I'm going to go into the bad news, and I'll try to end, leave you on a high note by returning to some good news at the end. So we have made progress in this issue. There are many measures of progress. One that was reported in Bloomberg News just a few weeks ago was this piece, Americans have never been so sure about climate change, even Republicans. 
Um, and it noted that the polling data showed a really significant, really statistically significant shift in the thinking of Republicans on the issue of climate change. So here's the change in public opinion, 2012 to 2015. Democrats have been pretty much on board on this issue for a while now, but look at this big uptick, um, 10, 11, 12 point uh, spread over just one year. That's a big, big shift. And so that tells us that even though it's been difficult, the message is getting out. The American people do get it and understand that climate change is underway. So that's the good news. Now we go to the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that actually there's no real net change since 2007. In fact, there's actually very little net change even from the 1990s, and you can look at poll data that show this. So in, 19, in 2007, the Gallup polling group showed that 72% of Americans were completely or mostly convinced that global warming is happening. And that figure has not actually changed very much in the last decade. So one of the questions that Eric Conway and I wanted to answer when we started writing Merchants of Doubt was, how were so many people persuaded for so long that man-made climate change wasn't happening when scientists were consistently telling us that it was? So I know that some of you have had the chance to see the film Merchants of Doubt or to read the book. But I just want to start by showing a very short clip from the film that really encapsulate, encapsulates in a couple of minutes what the essence of the doubt mongering strategy has been. So this man is Bill O'Keefe. He's not a scientist. He was the director of the George C. Marshall Institute that we wrote about in great detail in the book. It's a think tank that is heavily funded by ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel industries. Um, and also in this clip, you'll also see late Lee Raymond, uh, the former CEO of ExxonMobil. So let me just play you this small clip from the film. Bill O'Keefe is executive vice president of the American Petroleum Institute. He's also a board member of the Global Climate Coalition, made up of oil and electric companies, automakers, and others. We believe it was a war on oil. They had an off-oil agenda. Climate change was part of that. I, I think that it's unfortunate that the science is so distorted and misstated. Without the science is complicated. There are lots of different factors, so you really have to understand the whole picture. There is a natural variability that has nothing to do with man. Climate is changing naturally. It has to do with sunspots. It has to do with the wobble of the earth. And so it's not too difficult to persuade some of the public that we really don't know for sure. And so maybe let's wait a while. We need to have more proof. We need more data. The science isn't there to make that determination. There is no need for us to rush to this kind of judgment to respond. Others to put out ads saying more pollution is going to be good for us. A doubling of the CO2 content of the atmosphere will produce a tremendous greening of planet Earth. CO2 is a benefit to plant life. It's increasing uh, the bounty and the productivity of the planet, our ability to feed populations in this world. What you're seeing here from the coal industry is, is perfectly analogous to what the tobacco industry used to do. They refuse to change, refuse to shift, and they're trying to convince us that it's actually good for us, the way uh, they used to say, uh, luckies make you healthy. Yeah. So there it is in a nutshell, a group of people who are not scientists trying to persuade us that the science is very muddled and confused and distorted, even though actually the people distorting it are these people. Now, fortunately, those of you who have been here all day already have heard enough to know how these claims are misleading, uh, the plant productivity, we just heard about that, um, et cetera. So we know that these claims were very misleading. As I said, Bill O'Keefe is not a scientist. Um, so one of the questions, of course, that I wanted to answer first and foremost, well, what were scientists actually telling us uh, during this period? And again, most of you already know this, but just to recap, we have known that the climate was changing, that climate change driven by man's activities, driven by greenhouse gases, was underway. We have known this since the early to the mid-1990s. In 1995, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its second assessment report, concluded that the balance of evidence suggested a discernible human impact on global climate. And my own work, which Catherine referred to just a few moments ago, consisted of an analysis of the peer-reviewed scientific literature to answer the question, was that IPC statement, that statement of the scientific elites, the scientific leadership, was that consistent with what you could find in the peer-reviewed articles published by rank-and-file researchers? And the answer to that question turned out to be a resounding yes, um, that this consensus were, was reflected both in the statements of scientific leadership and in the publications of rank-and-file scientists. 
Now, when I published this in 2004, this result surprised many people, even people who accepted that climate change was real, who thought, as journalists had been telling them, that there was a climate change debate. But what I learned through my own research is that this should really not have been a surprise. In fact, in 1988, James Hansen, the climate modeler who you just saw in the film clip, had testified in the US Congress that he was 99% certain that climate change was now detectable. And again, man-made climate change. And in 1992, in part as a result of the early work of people like Jim Hansen and others, President George H.W. Bush signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, calling on world leaders to translate the written document into, quote, concrete action to protect the planet. He also said he promised that he was going to bring the power of the White House effect to fix the greenhouse effect. So how do we know about the greenhouse effect? Well, again, this is actually very old science. The idea that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas is something that goes back to the 19th century and the work of this man, John Tyndall, who in the 1830s did a set of experiments, sorry, the 1850s did a set of experiments that established the fact that carbon dioxide, water vapor, and other gases have this distinctive and important feature of being quite transparent to visible light, but relatively opaque to infrared. So light from the sun comes in and heats the planet, and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap that light and warm, sorry, trap that heat and warm the planet. Now, in the early 1900s, the Swedish geochemist Svante Arrhenius was the first to, see, to note that when you burn fossil fuels, at that time mostly coal, you produce carbon dioxide. And therefore, we could expect the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to begin to increase, and that this would probably lead to some global warming. Um, I like to talk about Arrhenius. I like to point out for the graduate students in the, in, in the, graduate students in the uh, audience, Arrhenius failed his doctoral examination and had a nervous breakdown, but still went on to have an illustrious scientific career. So <laughs> don't despair if things don't go perfectly in graduate school. Arrhenius is famous today in part because he did the first quantitative analysis of what the effect of doubling CO2 in the atmosphere would be and concluded that it would increase the temperature one and a half to four and a half degrees centigrade. Now, he was Swedish, so like the Russians today, he thought global warming would be a good thing, but the first person to suggest that it might not be a good thing, and actually that it might already be underway, was this man, Guy Stewart Callender, who in the 1930s published the first article in a peer-reviewed publication suggesting that actually existing measurements already showed a very small increase in CO2, and that this could be causing an increase in temperature. Now, shortly after this paper was published, World War II broke out, and so the issue was sort of put on the back burner, um, and it wasn't really, scientists didn't really return to it until the 1950s. In the 1950s, in 1957, as part of the preparation for the International Geophysical Year, this man, Roger Revelle, a famous American oceanographer, was thinking about the questions of what sort of data should scientists collect during the International Geophysical Year. And one of the things that he suggested, along with his colleague Hans Zeus, a geochemist, was that scientists should collect data on carbon dioxide. Because Arrhenius and Callender and others had already predicted that increased carbon dioxide should change the temperature of the planet. And so they suggested that they should begin to collect the data to test whether or not that theoretical prediction was coming true. And I think this helps to answer the question that was raised earlier today about the issue of correlation and causation being different. That's, of course, true. But the point is that this was framed as a test of a hypothesis. It wasn't just a correlation that people happened to stumble on. But because the basic physics was so obvious, so simple, and had been known for 100 years, the real question was a kind of empirical question. Are these effects actually happening? Are they detectable? Are they discernible, the word the IPCC used? in 1995. And so there became a tremendous focus on the empirical data in order to answer this question, is this really happening? We know theoretically that it could happen, and it maybe even should happen, but there could be lots of reasons why we might not be seeing the effect yet. And so for the next 20 or 30 years, a tremendous amount of scientific attention focused on this data collection to answer the question, is this actually happening now?
The person who is most associated now with this work is this man, Charles David Keeling, who in 1958 began the systematic measurement of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as part of the International Geophysical Year. There are many aspects of this story that have come to be sort of personal for me. I feel like the story of my own personal life have become intertwined in strange and weird ways. And one of them that has made me feel like it kind of was my destiny to do this work is that I was born in 1958. So I, the Keeling curve and I were born together. <laughs> and I also did know Dave Keeling uh, when he, in the years before he died when he was still teaching at the University of California. So Dave began that work in 1958. By 1965, he believed that he had enough data to show that, yes, indeed, there was a detectable increase from about 312 when he started measuring to 319. So just a few parts per million, but enough to say, yes, this is something that we actually can measure in the laboratory. And here he is in his lab. Oh, another thing for uh, aspiring scientists. Nobody wanted to work with Dave Keeling. This work was considered incredibly boring <laughs> because all you were doing was measuring CO2. But even though it seemed boring, it turned out to be incredibly scientifically significant. In 1965, Dave Keeling and, um, and Roger Revelle wrote a, an appendix to a report to the President's Science Advisory Committee in which they predicted that by the year 2000, there would be about 25% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at present, and that this would modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that marked changes in climate could occur. Again, this is the prediction based on basic physics and chemistry and the measurements that showed that this was already beginning to be an effect. And this 25% came from mass balance calculations they did based on knowing how much fossil fuel was being burned, calculating how much carbon dioxide that produced, and how many years would it take before we would reach a point of about 25%. And they were right about this. In fact, they were a little conservative. The actual figure was about 30% by the year 2000. And now we're up to almost 40% increase over pre-industrial levels. Lyndon Johnson read this report. And in a special message to Congress, he said in 1965, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. So if anybody ever says, oh, nobody knew, or nobody could have known, or this was somehow an accident, that's not true. We knew. Lyndon Johnson knew in 1965. However, he had some other things to worry about in 1965. The war in Vietnam wasn't going very well. Uh, civil rights workers were being killed in Mississippi. So it didn't come to the top of his docket. And not that much interest was generated in policy, policy circles at that time. But only a few years later, things began to change. And a number of things caused that change, but probably the most important was the rise of computer modeling. In the late 60s and early 70s, we saw the development of fast digital computers. And this enabled scientists to build, for the first time, general circulation models of the atmosphere that enabled them to study the Earth's climate as a system and to model the dynamics of the atmosphere in a quasi-realistic way and to consider long-term trends or as they put it in their own reports from that period, to revisit what they now were calling the calendar question. And this tells me, as a historian, that they were aware of the earlier work, they knew about these predictions, and now they frame these models as an answer to the calendar question. How does increased carbon dioxide impact the global climate system? And these models began to confirm these earlier results of calendar and Arrhenius. And that did lead to serious discussion in policy circles already by the mid-1970s, or actually even earlier. Uh, in 1972, a US delegation led by Tennessee Senator Howard Baker attended the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. Their report discusses climate change driven by carbon dioxide. 1976 World Meteorological Organization issues the first statement from the scientific community to say, yes, we think this is going to be a serious problem. Uh, NOAA, 1977, there's a big report called Energy and Climate, discusses this issue. Uh, the Jason Committee, the secretive group of physicists who advised the Department of Defense and Energy, wrote a report called The Long-Term Impact of Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide on Climate. And then the US National Research Council, its first major study, known as the Charney Report, named after Jewel Charney, a famous MIT um, meteorologist, so a whole set of reports in the 70s starting to say, yes, this is a serious issue to which we need to pay attention. Um, I did that for Wes's 
uh, benefit to say to which we need to pay attention, not pay attention to, because he reminded me that Harvard professors don't end sentences with propositions. <laughs> Prepositions or propositions. Okay, so what do we see happening in the scientific community? In 1979, the National Research Council actually summarized the results of these various studies and they said, a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. I like to emphasize this quotation for a few reasons. First of all, it shows that the scientific community is already um, saying, yes, we know this is a problem in 1979, but also because I sometimes get attacked by climate deniers, skeptics, contrarians, whatever you want to call them, because they say, oh, science isn't about consensus, you know, and they like to emphasize the idea of the lone individual who turns out to be right instead of everyone else. Um, and as a historian of science, that makes me really angry because it's such a misrepresentation of what we actually know about the history of science, but also because actually science is about consensus and scientists themselves use the term consensus to describe their own work. And so long before I ever wrote anything about climate change, the National Academy of Sciences is talking about their own consensus uh, that climate change will result from burning fossil fuel. So what we have in 1979 is a consensus that warming would happen. There was also a consensus that it would matter. So if we look at it, the uh, NRC proposal for this 1979 study, this is from the National Academy of Sciences archives, they wrote, the close linkage between man's welfare, and by the way, man, not just polar bears, uh, man's welfare and the climatic regime with which his society has evolved suggests that such climatic changes would have profound impacts on human society. So we see the articulation and the recognition that this isn't just about the planet or the environment, but it's about our own welfare. And there's a big discussion about impacts on agriculture, public health, all of those issues that George articulated so well just in a few minutes ago. What they did not yet have a consensus on in 1979 was when. When would these changes become discernible? And most scientists writing in the 1970s did not actually think that this problem was imminent. Most scientists didn't think that changes would be detectable until the end of the 20th or the beginning of the 21st century. So most scientists were surprised, and some were even upset, I think it's fair to say, when only six years later, NASA climate modeler Jim Hansen and his team concluded that the human signal on the climate system, the human fingerprint, had actually been detected. And this is what Hansen testified to in Congress uh, in the summer of 1988. It also led to this being reported on the front page of the New York Times, who in the summer of 1980 uh, published this article and noticed global warming has begun, expert tells Senate. And I like to point this out. Notice the headline, not global warming discovered or not global warming correlated with CO2, but global warming has just begun. This was a prediction that was now coming true. It also led to the introduction in Congress of the US National Energy Policy Act to establish a national energy policy to reduce the generation of carbon dioxide and trace gases as quickly as is feasible in order to slow the pace and degree of atmospheric warming. So um, I showed this to my friend Bob Inglis, who we mentioned earlier, um, to say, you know, you can just tell your colleagues in Congress they don't need to do any work on this issue. They just have to dust off the National Energy Policy Act of 1988 and pass it. <laughs> Thank you. So what happened? We have all this good science, we have a scientific consensus, we have the science being articulated and explained and communicated to policymakers. we have a law introduced into Congress, and then something goes wrong. So what really happened? So what we showed in our work is that as the scientific consensus emerged and gained media and political attention, so did a politically motivated campaign to challenge the scientific consensus, to cast doubt on the science and prevent policy action. The campaign focused, as you saw in that clip, on the claim that the science was uncertain, that we didn't really know, and therefore it was premature to act. And what Eric Conway and I tried to do in, the, in our book was to explain where did this come from? Who started this and why? And what we discovered, what was sort of, the, in a way, the shocking discovery for us, was that we could trace this climate change denial movement, which is now so widespread and involves so many different parties, that we could actually trace it back to a very small handful of people. In fact, to three men. It's kind of shocking to think that this is true, but it is. So these three men, Bob Jastrow, an astrophysicist, he was the head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, 
Bill Nirenberg, a nuclear physicist and the longtime director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and Frederick Seitz, the president of the National Academy of Sciences in the 1960s and later president of the Rockefeller University. So three very distinguished, very famous, very prominent, very brilliant scientists, all of whom had made major contributions to American science in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But in the 80s, they began to do some different things. They began working together on an advisory committee to the Reagan administration on the question of the Strategic Defense Initiative, also known as SDI or Star Wars. In 1984, they created a think tank called the George C. Marshall Institute to defend SDI against scientists' opposition. So initially, this had nothing to do with climate change. It was about defending SDI and defending the idea of a strong defensive posture based on technology to protect us against the Soviet threat. But at the same time, Fred Seitz had retired from the Rockefeller University and had taken on a job consulting to the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Corporation. And what Fred Seitz did at R.J. Reynolds was to run a research program. He was given $45 million in 1979, which he spent over the course of the next six years, dispersing grants to people, to scientists, to do distracting research, to do research on other causes of cancer other than tobacco use, like asbestos and radon, or to look at the role of stress in creating heart disease, to distract attention from the role of tobacco in causing adverse health effects, and to insist that the science was unsettled and therefore it would be premature for the US government or state or local governments to take action to control or discourage tobacco use. In 1989, these two stories merged. The Cold War came to a rather abrupt end. The Soviet Union disintegrated. The Soviet enemy was gone. So you might have thought that these men would be happy that the Cold War, that the West had won the Cold War. They'd pop some champagne corks, celebrate. But they didn't do that. Instead, they found a new enemy to fight, a new program. And that program was fighting what they called environmental extremism and what they believed to be the exaggeration of environmental threats by people with a left-wing agenda. So here we begin to see the core of the politicization of these questions. And they applied the tobacco strategy that Seitz had learned working with R.J. Reynolds to insist that the science was unsettled, that there wasn't a consensus, and that we didn't really know. Doubt is our product, ran the infamous memo written by one tobacco industry executive in 1969, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. That document played a large role in the prosecution of the tobacco industry uh, by the US Department of Justice for conspiracy to commit fraud against the American people. And it really sums up in a nutshell more than a million pages of documents that show us in great detail how the tobacco industry over the course of more than 40 years denied the overwhelming scientific evidence and kept selling manufacturing and advertising its product to the American people. But one of the things that the industry understood early on was that if an industry executive stood up in public and said, well, you know, we're not really persuaded that tobacco's bad, you can keep smoking, you know, we don't really know, most of us wouldn't really find that credible because we would understand that the industry executive was promoting his own corporate self-interest. But if the industry could find scientists to say that in public, that was a very different thing. They even had one project they called Project White Coat, which was to recruit scientists who would appear in public wearing laboratory coats uh, to say that the science was unsettled. And they particularly targeted journalists because the whole point of this, or a big point of this, was to get journalists to represent the tobacco story as a debate and to call it the tobacco debate because as long as scientists were debating, people could keep smoking. So recruiting scientists was a key part of this strategy. And that's what Seitz and Jastrow and Nuremberg then proceeded to do, but not just about tobacco. Throughout the 80s and 90s then, they began to apply this strategy to a whole set of issues, making common cause with different, different alliances, different industries, different people, over the threat of nuclear winter, the reality of acid rain, the severity and causes of the ozone hole, and of course, global warming. There's also a side story about DDT that they didn't personally get involved with, but a group of other people did using the same strategies and tactics. 
The physicists in our story cast doubt on the scientific evidence related to all these diverse issues, and in every case the argument was the same. In fact, we could say it was a kind of playbook. The science is unsettled, there's no consensus, the uncertainties are very great. We heard about that earlier today. There are many causes of the alleged phenomenon, so we don't really know what the real cause is. Fixing the problem would be too expensive, kill jobs, wreck the economy, you've all heard that one. And fixing the problem would undermine personal freedom. And therefore, nothing needs to be done, nothing should be done. And just to give you one example of how this played out, I want to talk about one specific incident involving a fourth scientist who joined this project a few years after uh, it was initiated, a man by the name of Fred Singer. Um, and Fred Singer is still alive and very litigious, so I should just preface this by saying he's a wonderful person, and I really like and respect him. So like the others, he was a Cold War physicist. In fact, he was the proverbial rocket scientist. And like the others, he was involved in campaigns to challenge the scientific evidence of acid rain, global warming, and the ozone hole, and also to defend tobacco. So from 79 to 85, Fred Seitz had worked for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. In the 90s, Fred Singer made common cause with Philip Morris to attack the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency over the issue of secondhand smoke. And I, like, I have an anecdote I like to tell about this one as well. Uh, the tobacco industry was very careful about what language it used, and it, and it often would decide to call something by a certain term that it thought was better and beneficial. So they decided they didn't like the term secondhand smoke because they reckoned Americans didn't like secondhand things. <laughs> so they decided to call it environmental tobacco smoke. But this was turned out to be a tactical mistake because the Environmental Protection Agency said, you're right, it is environmental, and therefore it falls under the rubric of environmental protection. <laughs> so that was a tactical error on their part. So in the early 1990s, the EPA declared secondhand smoke to be a Class A or proven carcinogen. This result had been affirmed by a number of studies from the U.S. Surgeon General's Office, and an independent peer-reviewed panel, an independent expert panel commissioned by the EPA, had reviewed over 6,000 peer-reviewed articles. So by the way, I never feel sorry for myself that I had to read 928. These guys reviewed 6,000 peer-reviewed articles from the United States, Germany, Japan, Australia, and concluded that secondhand smoke was responsible for 3,000 additional cancer deaths in America every year, and between 150 and 300,000 cases of bronchitis and pneumonia in infants and young children and also implicated in sudden infant death syndrome. And there's a whole interesting backstory about this, where the panel actually concluded that it was a cause of sudden infant death syndrome. EPA was worried that that result was so incendiary that they actually downplayed it and said, well, we're not 100% sure about, this is a co correlation, we're not sure about the causation here, but we're definitely sure about the causation there. Um, any event. So this was scientific evidence supported by diverse, independent, peer-reviewed studies from many different countries. But in 1993, Fred Singer decided to challenge it. He wrote a report calling EPA and the Science of Environmental Tobacco Smoke. It was published by a think tank called the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute. So notice there the kind of invocation of democracy in America. But all of the money for the report came from the Tobacco Institute, which was the so-called research arm of the tobacco industry. It was co-authored with a lawyer named Kent Jeffries, who was affiliated with the Cato Institute and the Competitive Enterprise Institute. So I'll say more about these think tanks in a minute. So why would a lawyer and a rocket scientist challenge the epidemiological and public health evidence of the harms of secondhand smoke? And why would anyone defend a product that kills children? Well, Fred Singer answered that question in his own words. He wrote, if we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there's essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. So that, I think, in a nutshell, summarizes the argument. This is not an argument about the science. It's an argument about government, about government intervention in the marketplace. It's an argument against government intervention and against regulation. None of these debates was about science. They're all about governance. And the question specifically of how much the government should regulate the marketplace even to protect people from scientifically documented dangers. And their answer to that question was that they shouldn't. And I can give you many, many examples. I could speak for three hours about this, but just to give you a couple, the Wall Street Journal has for many years been a major source of challenges in the mass media to climate science. And just to give one example, in 2003, sorry, they published a piece by Frank Luntz, a Republican pollster, who said, 
Once we can see that greenhouse gases must be controlled, it will only be a matter of time before we end up endorsing more economically damaging regulation. So you see a kind of slippery slope argument. Uh, greenhouse gases today, the whole economy tomorrow. Now, this argument was obviously convenient for the tobacco industry, as it is for the fossil fuel industry today. But I don't think it was just a matter of the economic interest of the fossil fuel or the tobacco industries, because it also helps to explain the origins of this story in the Cold War and the role of these Cold War physicists. And to answer the question, why would a great physicist like Fred Seitz reject all the work of his own colleagues in oncology and epidemiology? Well, these men were physicists who had dedicated their lives to containing communism. They really interpreted their scientific work in political terms. And this comes out of a lot of work we did reading their private letters. For them, defending the free market against government intrusion was an extension of their scientific work. And their argument was simply that government regulation was a slippery slope to socialism, a kind of backdoor to communism. So that if they didn't fight government intervention in the marketplace, that even though we'd won the Cold War through military superiority, we would end up losing it through a kind of backdoor channel. And in their writings, we see that they frequently assert that environmentalists, and by implication also scientists working on environmental issues, are really socialists and communists seeking to control our lives. And if you go on the internet, you see that I get accused of this as well. And I always kind of laugh at this because I think, God, I know so many scientists. You know, my scientific, my education is in science. I've lived with scientists. My husband's a scientist. Like, the scientists I know can't even control their own desks. How could they possibly try to control anybody else's life, you know? But they refer to environments as watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside. George Will, who writes for the Washington Post, has called environmentalism a green tree with red roots. And Senator James Inhofe has threatened to indict climate scientists for conspiracy to lie to Congress and has accused me, as well as many others, as being part of the liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism, to which I reply, liberals should be that organized. <laughs> and when Mitt Romney ran for president of the United States and said in an interview that he did think that humans had contributed somewhat to global warming, he was immediately attacked by former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, who said that the push to control climate change was the newest excuse to con take control of our lives. And of course, we've seen in this most recent election round that all the Republican candidates, all of them, have expressed at least some degree of doubt about the scientific conclusions regarding climate change. And Donald Trump, the current uh, front runner, has said that it's, he calls it the global warming hoax created by and for the Chinese. Now, there are many things wrong with these different claims. I could spend another hour just unpacking them. But one that I like to talk about as a historian is one that's not actually obvious to many Americans. But it's the fact that environmentalism is not a green tree with red roots. It's actually a green tree with very conservative roots. It doesn't even have liberal roots. The American environmental movement finds its origins in the progressive republicanism of men like Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the US Forest Service, and as I like to point out, that great communist John D. Rockefeller. <laughs> Indeed, through most of the 20th century, throughout, from the 1910s right up through the 1970s, there was a widespread bipartisan consensus in this country, but with stronger support typically on the Republican rather than the Democratic side on the importance of wilderness and environmental protection. And I started making a list of all the different acts I could find that had passed co Congress by wide bipartisan margins. And I couldn't fit them all on a slide. So I just have a few selected ones. But starting in 1917, I love this one, FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, which regulates these chemicals, through to the Wilderness Act, 1964. By the way, this is one of my other claims to fame. I had a joke about this I used to tell. The Wilderness Act passed the Senate by a vote of um, 93 to 1. And so I used to joke, I was trying to figure out who the one was. And President Obama stole that joke and used it in the State of the Union address a, a couple of years ago. So anyway, the answer is I actually found out who the one was. It was a senator who voted against it because he didn't think it went far enough. So anyway, NEPA, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, all of these passed by wide bipartisan majorities. And indeed, as many people are aware, the US Environmental 
Protection Agency was created by Republican President Richard Nixon, who in hindsight now seems like a great environmentalist. So I've actually been spending time in the Nixon archives trying to better understand how, in, how the Nixon administration thought about environmental protection. But you'll have to invite me back next year for that talk. Um, and of course, as many people know, President Nixon signed into law the key pieces of legislation that really created the foundation of environmental protection in the United States as we know it today, as well as serving as models for environmental protection in many other countries. But things began to change in the 1980s when several things happened, but three which I think are particularly significant for our story. The first is that in response to the stalled economic growth of the 1970s, the stagflation, high unemployment, the Reagan administration and also the Thatcher administration in the United Kingdom began to argue very, very strongly for less government and less regulation, specifically following the advocacy of the free market economist Milton Friedman. In 1989, as we've already mentioned, the Cold War ended. And for many conservatives, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of Soviet communism was taken as a vindication of free market capitalism and proof of the linkage between free market economies and personal freedom. And the slogan began to be used, particularly in the Eastern European bloc, capitalism is freedom. And this, of course, comes from the work of Milton Friedman and his most famous book that has the title Capitalism and Freedom. And this was the crux of Milton Friedman's argument that capitalist free market economies protect and defend and guarantee personal liberty, whereas once you begin to control an economy, then it's only a matter of time before you'll lose your personal freedoms as well. And finally, three, and this is the sort of bad luck contingency of the story, the evidence of acid rain and ozone hole and anthropogenic climate change began to coalesce just at the very time that the Reagan administration was making this argument for less government and less regulation, but these problems seem to demonstrate the need for more regulation. And this, Eric and I argue, put scientific evidence on a collision course with conservative thinking, a collision course on which we're still traveling. Because admitting the reality of climate change, like re admitting the reality of the effects of tobacco use or ozone depletion or acid rain, means admitting the reality of market failure. It means acknowledging what economists call external costs. The price of doing business or using a product like tobacco or fossil fuels these costs that are not adequately addressed by market economics, and the fact that sometimes governments do need to intervene to address market failures. And this is the common thread that links these otherwise diverse scientific issues like tobacco, acid rain, ozone, DDT, and climate change. They're all market failures. They're all problems that arose from economic activities like smoking, selling tobacco, or fossil fuel consumption that generated large, substantial external costs. Costs not reflected in the prices that we pay for those goods and services. Costs that are borne by people who do not reap the benefits of that. We saw that in George's slide with the disproportion where, where we use fossil fuels versus where the impacts are going to hit. And costs that threaten our health, our well-being, and ultimately our prosperity. In the Stern Review for the British Government uh, on climate change, uh, Lord Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank, called anthropogenic global warming the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. Indeed, he, argue, he has argued that the costs of climate change threaten the very prosperity that economic activity is intended to generate. And this is why climate scientists have become targets for attack. Because it wasn't economists doing economics who discovered these market failures. It was scientists doing science. None of these scientists that Eric and I studied, the people who worked on acid rain or the ozone hole, none of them thought they were examining the problem of market failure. They thought they were looking at the effects of acid precipitation on forests and lakes, or the effect of you know, ozone, CFCs on ozone. But it was science, scientists doing science, that led to the conclusion that government intervention was needed to remedy this market failure. And global warming became the biggest fight of all, bigger than acid rain or even tobacco, because energy consumption is at the root of all economic activity, and because fossil fuels are our dominant form of energy. And how do you remedy a market failure? Well, with some kind of intervention that originates outside the market. We solved these earlier problems, like acid rain, the ozone hole, DDT, et cetera, 
with appropriate government interventions. So just to remind you, we fixed the problems related to DDT by banning its use in the United States. That was a government intervention in the market. We solved acid rain in the Midwest and Canada, as well as air pollution in Southern California, by setting up an emissions trading system for sulfur pollution. That was a market intervention. We solved the ozone hole by banning the chemicals that caused it. And tobacco is interesting, and I think in some ways tobacco is the best analogy for us, because we didn't just do one thing to address tobacco. We actually did a big mix of things, a mix of instruments that included civil and state-based litigation, so actual prosecution of the industry for some of its illegal activities, uh, bans on smoking in public places, bans on smoking in aircraft, for example, and also heavy sin taxes, which, we, which studies show have a very strong effect in deterring young people from taking up smoking. And we now know from good work at places like CDC and elsewhere that if, if you don't start smoking by 25, you almost certainly won't. And it turns out that taxation is a very effective way to discourage young people from smoking. We solved these various problems and market failures with government interventions, and they worked. We, and we did not find ourselves living in a Soviet-style dictatorship. In fact, I gave this, a similar talk in Minnesota a few years ago. I said, you know, I've really enjoyed my last three days in Minnesota, and as far as I can tell, you guys are just as free as people in Massachusetts, you know? So emissions trading doesn't take away people's personal liberties. But we did find ourselves expanding the role of the government in the marketplace. That's just a fact. So what's really going on here is what sociologists and psychologists refer to as implicatory denial. People deny the evidence of things when they don't like their implications, like when you discount the evidence that your spouse is cheating on you even though you see strange phone calls on the phone bill, right? We all do this to some extent. It's also a form of confirmation bias. We accept evidence of things we already believe in. We tend to discount evidence of things we don't like or don't want to believe in. We deny things because we don't like what they imply. The merchants of doubt denied the reality of a set of problems because they disliked the character of the solutions to them. They resisted accepting the implication that the free market had failed in some significant way and that the government did indeed need to do something. And this remains true of many people in the United States today. It also helps explain why climate denial is so much more of a problem here than it is in Europe, because in Europe the ideology of free market laissez-faire capitalism is not nearly as strong as it is here in the United States. We don't want to accept how bad the situation really is, in part because we, don't, because we like the way we live and we don't want to change it. And I would argue that this isn't just true of deniers. It's actually true of a lot of ordinary Americans who maybe don't have particularly strong views about climate change one way or the other, or don't have particularly strong views about free market capitalism, but kind of like the way we live and don't like the implication that climate change means we might have to change the way we live. But there is good news. So as I said, I don't want to depress you. I want to leave you feeling that there is good news and there's something we can learn from this history. I think that this insight gives us some ideas on how we can move past now and how we can communicate with our neighbors and friends who are anxious or worried about big government. So one of the first things I think we need to do is we need to recognize the problem of facsimile science. And this again gets back to journalists. So much of climate denial involves creating stories, reports, things that look like science, but they aren't really. And those really confuse a lot of us, even many of us who are educated. So I just want to show one little clip from the film um, that illustrates the point of facsimile science um, and how serious it is. They present themselves as scientific, and they even use graphics to make them look like the actual scientific reports that they're trying to discredit. This is a report produced by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And here is the mirror of that, produced by the Cato Institute. And notice the Cato is the same people who did that tobacco study. They've adopted the exact same page layout design. If you were a congressman, how would you tell the difference between this and this one? And that's the point of this deception. This is kind of an extended summary. It's yeah. called a synthesis report. This is Fred so Singer. The actual IPCC report is about so thick. And how thick is your NIPCC report? Same. <laughs> it's the same. You're as thick as they are? We, we, we strictly <laughs> use the same thickness. So. Okay, so there you have it in a nutshell. So how would you tell those things apart? It's not easy. 
But a key thing is who published it, right? Was it published by a scientific group like the National Climate Assessment, or was it published by the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank heavily funded by the Koch brothers? So you have to ask the question, who is behind this thing? And as I point out, so this is Fred Singer, the same man who, you know, more than 30 years ago was defending secondhand smoke and attacking the EPA um, over the scientific evidence. Okay, a second thing is that we need to understand that there's actually a long history in the United States of the private sector making highly exaggerated claims that government intervention in the marketplace threaten our freedom as a strategy to protect their own profits, and in some cases actually constrict competition. And this is something that I did not understand when we were writing Merchants of Doubt, but I've learned more about in recent years. So this is a, an advertisement that was published in Reader's Digest in 1962, and you can see it says, how is freedom lost? And this is a picture of some people behind the Berlin Wall. So what do you think this might be an advertisement for? Anyone want to guess? Tobacco? Seatbelts? That's a good guess. I like that one. Anything else? Guns? That would be a good guess. Anything else? Barbed wire. Barbed wire. <laughs> Could be an ad for barbed wire. <laughs> or hats. <laughs> no, the correct answer is private sector electricity. This was a set of advertisements run in the 1960s against federal dam projects arguing, and I'm not going to say that I'm necessarily in favor of federal dams, but arguing that if the federal government were allowed to build dams to generate electricity, we would end up living in an Eastern European style dictatorship. Now you can argue the merits or demerits of federal dam projects, but isn't it, this is the privately owned electric light and power company, more than 300, uh, and it says, isn't it time to call a halt to the expansion of government and business? So there it is, it's electricity. So this is actually a very old story, and I'm doing some more work now to better understand how these arguments were created. And I used to think that this actually had been invented by the tobacco industry, but I now know that's wrong, that actually we can trace this back at least to the 1920s and to arguments about electri uh, rural electrification and then also the New Deal in the 1930s. So this is an old story, and we should wake up and know that it's there. Okay, three, and now we get to the good news part. Focus on solutions. And I was so happy to see the Citizens Climate Lobby here because uh, I think they've really done some great work in helping us kind of shift the conversation. The whole point of climate change denial, like tobacco denial before, is to deny the problem to avoid implementing solutions. So one of the most important things we can do, I think, is to focus on solutions and not allow ourselves to get mired into debates about the reality or the details of the problem. Right? We know climate change is happening. We want scientists to keep studying it because that's what they do. But for the rest of us, the real question is, how do we solve this problem? So the answer, I think, sorry, do I have? Oh, yeah, OK. So one of the things I've been doing the last year or two when I travel and go places is to use it as an opportunity to talk to people about interesting things that are happening in their communities. And I have to say, I feel the good news of this story is incredible things are happening all across the United States, Canada, and the world. Um, that really demonstrate kind of proof of concept that we really can live without fossil fuels and we can live well. We don't have to suffer and freeze in the dark. So I want to just give you uh, four examples of things I've learned about just in the past few uh, weeks and months. Buildings that generate more energy than they use and cost no more than average to build. Renewable energy based on microgrids in which communities become uh, self-sufficient. Off-grid solar thermal heating and cooling. Zero energy agriculture and energy modeling that shows how we can use grid integration to scale up to meet broad needs. So I want to spend a few minutes just talking about some specific real life examples. These all exist. None of these are just theoretical. These are all either built or being built in different places today. So how many of you have heard of the Bullet Center in Seattle, Washington? A, couple, a few people. Okay, good. It's a highly educated audience. That's good. Um, this is the headquarters of the Bullet Foundation, which is a private foundation based in Seattle that works on environmental protection and development in the, what they call the Cascadia region, Pacific Northwest, including Canada. And this is, they claim, the greenest commercial building in the world. This building produces 52% more energy than it uses. They largely do it through this rooftop solar array, which you can see it has this big hat on top. And notice the little holes in the roof to allow uh, rain and also sunlight to come down. So this PV array generates more than 52% energy net than the building uses, including heating and other things. And this, they like to point out, is in Seattle, one of the most famously unsunny cities in the world. So this is a proof of concept because it shows if you can do it in Seattle, you can probably do it in most places in America. 
And very importantly, when they built this building, they worked with engineers and architects, and they stipulated that the construction costs had to be within the normal range of commercial construction in Seattle. So people couldn't say, oh, that's all very well for rich Chardonnay drinking liberals, right? The normal cost of construction in Seattle commercial buildings is between $300 and $600 per square foot. This building came in at $350 a square foot. And it saves the tenants money because their energy costs are so low. So the owner, the Bullitt Foundation, is actually able to rent space at a higher than average level because this is such a nice building to work in. And there's a bunch of other things they did. If people are interested, I can talk about some of the details. But one of the interesting things they had to do to build this building was to negotiate with the local utilities to um, overcome obstacles to feeding into the grid because most utilities actually don't want a lot of distributed energy being fed to the grid, and we can talk more about that if you want as well. So this building exists. You can visit it. You can talk to the people about it. They have a whole book about it now, and it's really a beautiful example of real-life affordable green buildings. Another interesting example is a company in Australia called Zen Energy Australia. They're taking a microgrid approach. One of the problems with renewable energies, of course, is the intermittency project problem. But if you're sharing with people and storing power, you can solve most of the issues related to intermittency. Also, Australia is probably the best place on Earth for solar PV. So this is based on solar PV with local battery storage and demand response pricing to encourage efficiency. So you pay more when demand is high, you pay less when demand is low, and that leads people to change the way they use electricity in ways that encourage efficiency. So they're already working with developers to build whole communities that are going off grid. Now, right now, their model is to actually be connected to the grid as a kind of backup, but to minimize, like to design the community not to have to use the, the actual grid. But ultimately, the idea is that these communities will be completely off grid. And this is really, really good for communities in Australia that are distant from the grid, so it saves on transmission costs. And this is also a nice model for places uh, in Canada as well that might be far from major sources of electricity generation. Now, some people think it's better to be off the grid altogether. And I just, last week when I was in Australia, got to meet with a really cool group of private investors who are building an off-grid solar thermal building that is entirely energy self-sufficient. And there's a lot of things that are really interesting about this building. So the whole thing is done with solar hot water heating and evaporative cooling. And it's done by having false floors. So lots of commercial buildings have false ceilings where all kind of wiring and stuff is put in. But they have false floors. And in the floors, a set of tubes that will run hot and cold water through the building, hot water in winter, cool water in summer, to heat and cool this building with no electricity use at all. Now, they need some electricity for lighting. So for that, some of the hot water, this is Australia, they have a set of uh, mirrors on the roof which concentrate the solar radiation. You can use solar thermal to heat hot water to the boiling point. So they will have on-site small-scale electricity turbines to generate electricity for lighting the building. So both the heat, the cooling, and the light will all be done completely on-site, completely off-grid. And the really beautiful thing about this building, so this is under construction right now. This is being built in Elizabeth, Australia. Anybody here know about Elizabeth or ever been there? No, exactly, that's the point. You've never heard of this place. It's not famous. It's the Australian equivalent of a Rust Belt town. It's the home of the GM Holden plant that used to employ 6,000 workers, workers building General Motors cars in Australia. That factory now has 200 people, basically just caretakers, and it's going to be shuttered completely. So this is a town with very high unemployment, there isn't a lot of people willing to pay a lot of money for fancy pants renewable energy, but they are building this in that town with investors. Local, this is all private sector investment, and they're also working now with developers to build a residential property, 24 residential homes that will be similarly totally off-grid, affordable housing for ordinary middle-class people in a, a, well, less than ordinary, in a town that has high unemployment, high, you know, drug use, and a lot of other social issues. So if you can do it in Seattle, you can do it in Elizabeth, Australia, this is really making the argument that these things can be done in most places. Here's another one, and I'm curious what Wes will think about this. He may not like this, but this is fossil fuel-free agriculture. This is also in Australia. This is in a town called Port Augusta that sits at the uh, northern end of the uh, Spencer Gulf in South Australia, right where sort of the Southern Ocean meets the outback in the northern sort of northern part of the South Australian coastline. This, again, is a Rust Belt community. It used to have a major metal smelter there, pretty high unemployment, not a super highly educated uh, workforce. They are now growing tomatoes. This is happening today. 
that are being sold in ordinary supermarkets in Australia, so not in Whole Foods, but in the Coles supermarket there. Uh, private sector investment, although they did have some uh, seed money from an Australian uh, innovation fund, government innovation fund. But they are use, doing this entirely using solar greenhouses and solar desalinated seawater. So this is on the edge of the outback in an area where there's essentially no surface fresh water available and the groundwater is very salty. But they're taking seawater, desalinating it using solar power, using the desalinated water to um, water the crops and growing tomatoes that are sold in stores. And again, this is happening today. So these are examples of real life things that are happening and we know they can work. We don't need to dream up miracle technologies or wait for breakthroughs in the future. This is all happening now. Now one of the lessons I take from this and from all of the work that I've done on the ideology of climate change denial is that I think that one of the lessons is that we should embrace market-based solutions wherever possible. To the extent that market-based solutions can work, we should accept them. Because after all, this is not an excuse to expand government. This is not the slippery slope to socialism, right? This is a problem that needs to be solved before many people get hurt, and as George stressed in his talk, before we all get a lot poorer. So the examples I offer just now are all examples of private sector activity. But, of course, you may ask, and people do, but what about scaling? How do we scale this up? Are these really realistic to be scaled up? And again, what about the intermittency problem? People who are skeptical of climate change, or even people who aren't, even people who support renewables will ask, yeah, but what about intermittency? What about storage, right? This is often put forward as the big obstacle to large-scale renewable energy adoption. Well, it turns out it's actually not a problem, or at least it's probably not a problem. So this is a recent paper that was published by Alexander McDonald, the scientist at NOAA, and a group of scientists at NOAA and Colorado University Boulder. Now, it's just a model. Uh, it hasn't actually been shown. We haven't done this yet. But there are certain things that, in order to do them, we have to figure out how to do it. We've got to model it in order to see what it looks like to fix this problem. And this was just published a few weeks ago in Nature Climate Change. There are a number of other studies that come up with similar reports, work from the National Renewable Energy Laboratories, uh, Mark Jacobson's group at Stanford. Some people don't like Jacobson's work, but the bottom line is his results are similar to other people. So this is a modeling study by these scientists that looked at the question of whether or not electricity needs in the United States can be met by renewables, achieve the emissions reductions we need without increasing the cost of electricity. And what they showed in this study was that we can meet all of U.S. electricity needs, including some degree of projected growth based on population, and get emissions reductions of up to 80% by large-scale adoption of renewables without increasing our use of natural gas, without expanding nuclear power, just using existing nuclear power plants as they run out, and with currently existing technologies, so no magic breakthroughs, and without any storage at all. So how, how can we do that? The answer is grid integration. So I like to have say this is a really, really sexy thing, grid integration, right? Um, it's geekish, but it's really important. So here's it. It's basically simple. Yes, it's true, the sun doesn't always shine. And yes, it's true, the wind doesn't always blow. But if you look at the United States as a whole, and particularly if you look at the United States and Canada and Mexico, if you think about North America, the sun is always shining somewhere in North America for about 18 hours of the day. And the wind is always blowing somewhere. And they actually, the energy model uses data, weather data from NOAA, to actually look at how much the wind blows and how much the sun shines in different parts of the United States and Canada at any given moment. And the answer is there's almost always, well, if you include wind, the wind is blowing somewhere always. The sun is almost always shining. You have a few hours of darkness, right? So if you build an integrated grid that connects Quebec and Arizona and Seattle and Nebraska and Missouri, you actually have the energy you need to satisfy the energy needs of this country, and you keep a little bit of existing nuclear power, you keep the existing hydro in the Pacific Northwest and Quebec, you have the energy you need. It's just a matter of getting it to people, and you can do that with grid integration. There's a couple of other things you need, too. They advocate using direct current for minimizing transmission losses, but, of course, there is one really critical thing. 
the price of fossil fuels needs to be high enough to make renewables economically competitive in the marketplace. And that brings us back to citizens' climate lobby and why a carbon tax is so important. This model, if you don't have the sufficiently high price for fossil fuels, well, you can still get a pretty good result even without that, but you only get about 40% emissions reduction because you end up with a lot more gas and less renewables. Anyway, I highly recommend if you're at all interested in this problem, get this paper out, read it, absorb it, think about it. Call me if you have questions. Bring questions to class tomorrow. No, I'm not here. Okay. <laughs> but where does this bring us? Ultimately, it brings us back to the role of governance. The key to the McDonald result is grid integration, also demand response, prom, demand, respi, demand response pricing to current efficiency, and this high enough price for fossil fuels. So, oh, so, so how do we get those things? Well, I, like I always like to say, I can change my light bulbs, but I can't change my grid, right? As an individual, there's a lot you can do to fight climate change, but there are certain things that we have to do collectively as a country, or if it includes Canada and Mexico, we have to think about doing it under some kind of bilateral or trilateral agreement. And that has to be done by government. I can't integrate the grid on my own, right? And the private sector can't integrate the grid on their own. The grid was built by the federal government, and it's got to be modernized by the federal government. And that's just a fact. Demand response pricing, private sector can do that, but it re requires some re changes in our regulatory structure. Big Supreme Court decision just a couple weeks ago. In fact, the last decision that Justice Scalia voted on was a a uh, case about demand response pricing in California. If you're interested, FERC versus, I forget, US, I forget who it was. Anyway, I forget who was fighting. But anyway, you can find it. Just look up FERC, demand response pricing, California, Supreme Court. You can find the, the thing. Interestingly enough, Justice Scalia voted against the demand response pricing, even though this is a market-based solution, right? This is basic supply and demand. And the high enough price for fossil fuels, well, the easiest way to do that is to put a price on carbon. So, yes, we should embrace market-based solutions. Yes, it's important to persuade our conservative neighbors and friends that this is not an excuse to bring in big government by the back door. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the limits of market-based mechanism. We need a price on carbon to create the stronger incentives. Right now, the incentives are just not strong enough to encourage innovation, private sector innovation, at the pace we need. And a carbon tax can only work to the extent that there are workable alternatives. So if I don't have an integrated grid, making solar energy from Arizona available to me, then we could talk about it till the cows come home. But we've got to make sure that these alternatives are available to us, and that's where the public sector comes in for grid integration, for demand management, and for investment in better DC current transmission and those kinds of technical things. We also have to stop utilities from blocking renewable development. That's happening right now in a lot of places. North Carolina, it's a big issue. Uh, tremendous wind capacity in North Carolina that's being blocked by the existing utilities. So we have to work with utilities and municipalities to update the regulatory structures to maximize renewable utilization. And this was a big part of what the Bullet Center people had to do in Seattle. And you can read about that in their material. So the bottom line is government has to play its appropriate role. The market isn't magic. Markets are human institutions, and like all human institutions, they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses, their successes and their failures. So I would like to argue that we have to reject the deification of the free market and the demonization of government. And remember that the whole point of governance is to balance competing interests and competing interpretations of freedom. And since we're in Missouri, I thought I would end with this uh, quotation from Abraham Lincoln. 1864 was probably the darkest year in the history of this republic. And when Lincoln was struggling with trying to figure out how to keep the Union together, how to bring it back together after the devastation of the, well, you, would you say they don't call it the Civil War in the South? Wouldn't you say? Someone told me they call it. The War of Northern Aggression. That was it, the War of Northern Aggression. So Lincoln was struggling with how to bring the Union back together after the War of Northern Aggression, and otherwise known as the Civil War. Um, and he wrote, we all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat, for which the sheep thanks the shepherd as a liberator, while the wolf denounces him for the same act as the destroyer of liberty. Or as Isaiah Perlin put it some years later, both liberty and equality are among the primary goals pursued by human beings throughout many centuries, but total liberty for wolves is death to the lamb. Total liberty of the powerful is not compatible with the rights to a decent existence of the rest. 
And above all, I think, we have to reject the canard that capitalism is freedom. It's a pithy slogan, but it's just not true. Capitalism isn't equivalent to freedom. We have many examples in history of governance, governments and countries that were run under essentially free market economic principles, but in which there was tremendous suppression and denial of freedom. The most obvious was the government of Chile under General Pinochet, who ran it as a capitalist dictatorship. China today, which economists have had to come up with a new term to describe the economy in China since it's not communistic anymore, and they now call it market authoritarianism. So a market-based system, but with an authoritarian government. And of course, I don't have to remind you that in the United States, for a long time, we had slavery. Freedom, I would argue, as a historian, is not protected by our forms of distributing goods and services, but by our forms of governance, by our laws, and by our civic society and our civic norms. The European historian Tim Snyder, who's recently written a very provocative and interesting book about the Holocaust, has spent 30 years studying fascism in Europe and the conditions that led to the rise of Nazi Germany. And in his most recent book, Black Earth, he writes, a common American error is to believe that freedom is the absence of state authority. State authority, of course, can be abused, but its absence does not lead to liberty. On the contrary, he argues its absence leads to tyranny and tragedy. And the specific he give, example he gives in details in his book is that one of the first steps that the Nazis took when they occupied Eastern European countries was to dismantle civic authority and to strip citizens of their normal civil protections. And that was the first step on what was a slippery slope to Holocaust. He concludes from that example that appropriate forms of authority are essential to the guarantee of liberty. And what I'd like to add to that is the idea that as, it, as disruptive climate change unfolds, they will be essential to the guarantee of life and the pursuit of happiness as well. Thank you very much. Dr. Eskis has said that she has a very high stamina for questions. <laughs> for those of you who feel like you need to leave, go ahead and leave. We will go ahead and take questions for a few minutes. I'll start with Wes. So we put a cap on carbon. We have a tax on carbon. And the money goes to the government. And now how does the government keep money out of carbon trouble? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. So the, did everybody hear that? Yeah, okay. So um, this is one of the reasons why many people advocate revenue neutral carbon taxation, that if the government simply takes the money, then there's no guarantee how it will be used, no guarantee that it will be used in effective ways. So if you make it revenue neutral, give the money back to people, well, A, that obviate some of the concerns of conservatives who worry that this is just an excuse to expand government, but it also addresses the concern of how the government would use it. So you give the money back to the people, and effectively you let people decide for themselves. So citizens' climate lobby are strong advocates for what's known as a fee and dividend system, where you would actually get a check in the mail, and that is up to you to decide how you, um, how you use it. Um, the other way you can do it is revenue neutrality by cutting other taxes, either personal income tax or corporate taxes. In British Columbia, where they have a revenue neutral carbon tax, which has in fact lowered their emissions substantially since it was implemented, they got support and buy-in from the private sector by lowering personal and corporate income tax. So both ways can work. We have evidence that either works. Um, you know, this is, it becomes essentially a political question, which you think is preferable. I have some concerns about the fee and dividend issue only because there's some evidence from some research that one of the risks of the fee and dividend system is what's known as the Jevons paradox. Do people know what that is? So that's the paradox that if you save money, you just go out and buy more stuff. And uh, my version of that is I call it the Ross dress for less paradox. So how many people have ever shopped at Ross? 
you get discounted clothing. My husband used to always say if I went to Ross, it's not dress for less, it's more clothes for the same money. Because <laughs> you end up spending more, you know, you end up spending the, sa the same money, but you get more stuff. So the risk with the fee and dividend system is people get their checks and they say, wow, that's great, I have this check in the mail, now I'm going to go out and take a ski vacation, or now I'm going to go out and buy a new um, high definition television. And so there's a kind of rebound effect where now you're using more carbon. But if the carbon tax is high enough, I've got my dividend check and now I'm trying to decide, should I take that ski vacation or should I use it to put in energy efficient windows? The ski vacation is going to be more expensive because of the carbon tax. The energy efficient windows will be less expensive. So there is a financial incentive pushing me in the direction of lower carbon use overall. But the carbon tax has got to be high enough for that to really work. And so then you have this political question of, can you really get it to be high enough? But in BC they have. It's $30 a ton now in BC. Alberta's just brought in a carbon tax at $20 a ton. That's a little low by most economists' reckonings, but look at it this way. It's Alberta. <laughs> I mean, it's the Texas of the North, right? So if Alberta can do it, that suggests that you know, anybody can probably do it. So even if they come in a little low to start, it's a start, it's good, and hopefully over time they can ramp it up to a level that really has the effect that we need it to have. So I would like to point out that you actually ended your talk on a theme that um, Dr. Alley, who was our first speaker in this oh, okay. um, series, ended his talk, which was advocating the um, strengthening of our um, transmission grid, mm. which, with which many of us agree. I, however, in our community, where we, in fact, have a, uh, agreed to do so, there has arisen um, protests about that because of the concern of health effects. Um, with, and so I would ask um, Dr. Luber, particularly since this is his to area, to, <laughs> to, to particularly help answer this question. I doubt that he has the answer to this, but I think it's extremely important in our national interest to have a very clear understanding of what the health risks are of high, of high voltage transmission lines and how to minimize those risks because that really has to be addressed and um, I don't think that it really is clear yet as to what the risks are and how to best um, contain those risks. Yeah. Dr. Luer may wish to answer that. Um, he may know more than I, but... Um, <laughs> intelligent on it. Yeah, but have you ever thought about how to do a study like that? Yeah. It's really, really, really kind of impossible. <laughs> sure. Oh, I agree with you. I just, that question I got to sidestep. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And actually, the NRC did do a big study some years ago that was kind of inconclusive. I mean, it's too bad uh, Dr. McNutt left, but maybe you can email her and suggest this. I mean, it would be really good for the NRC to go back and do a more comprehensive and more detailed study, because I've read the NRC report on that, and I think there are some important things that they left out, uh, including some of the social science dimensions. So I think that would be a great thing to suggest to them. The other thing about that I would just say is um, I am an advocate of grid integration. I find the energy modeling work to be pretty persuasive. But this is also an argument in favor of microgrids, right? Because microgrids obviate the need for the big, large-scale transmission. And um, thanks, but you don't need to do that. Um, and, and also because, you know, big transmission towers are ugly, right? And microgrids obviate the blight on the landscape of large-scale transmission wires. So I, I think we haven't really talked that much about microgrids in the United States. Amory Lovins at the Rocky Mountain Institute has done some work on that. But I think there's a lot of potential for microgrids, especially in small towns in America. Um, so I think, yes, I support integrated grids, but I also think we should get microgrids more on to the, to, into the conversation. It seems uh, well, one uh, really appealing advantage among many of both the microgrid or, and the integrated uh, grid approach is uh, 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 resist uh, uh, ability to uh, overcome disruptions uh, uh, locally uh, at the power plant. And it strikes me that, is it possible you could have a very unexpected ally uh, because sabotage would not be a problem and the Homeland Security folks might find some, uh, uh, draw some, uh, uh, get, uh, capture their ears a little bit? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think 
In principle, yes. I mean, in practice, a large integrated grid would still be subject to deliberate disruption, and maybe you could argue actually more vulnerable if you don't have certain kinds of protections in place. I'm not an expert by any means on those issues, um, but certainly the issue of, of grid stability is one that uh, a lot of utilities I do know worry about. And there was a couple of years ago, there was a fire in an electrical substation in California that was kept kind of quiet, and there was a lot of speculation that that was actually a sabotage incident and that the utilities didn't want to talk about that. So I know there are people who know a lot about that, and I'm not one of them, but it's certainly an interesting issue. The other thing also obviously that comes up is no grid solutions altogether, right? And I think a place to watch if I were an investor, if I had any money to invest, you know, this uh, power wall concept that uh, Elon Musk is trying to develop. I mean, my electricity in my home is now all PV, except I'm on the grid, so I'm feeding it and taking back. But I mean, if I could put a power wall in my basement and be independent, that would be much better for me because we routinely lose power at least once or twice every winter. And usually it's just for a few hours and it's no big deal. But um, three years ago, right before we moved to Massachusetts, there was a five-day power outage in my neighborhood. And one of the things that's so interesting is to see how people in highly developed westernized countries respond when they lose the technology they take for granted. So my neighbors did what your Alaskans did. They dug uh, freezers in the snow and all these sophisticated people in Boston with advanced degrees were taking the food out of their freezers and burying it in the snow in their backyards. And that's how people managed a five-day power outage uh, in Massachusetts. Thank you for um, busting the myth of the base load. Mm -hmm. You know that we can't have uh, renewable because we have to have this base load. Uh, I'd like, and also thank you for pointing out how old this story is—that mm -hmm. it goes back to the twenties. And how how would you suggest that we reclaim, like that um, collectivism is okay for <laughs> corporate persons? Yeah, yeah. Right. So how can we reclaim the 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 value of collective action? Mm -hmm. And collectivism, yeah. and, re and disconnect it from the old fears of communism. Yeah, well, it's a really good question, and of course, it's not easy because we've been living for 30 years under this rhetoric uh, that you know, that big government is bad. Everything the government touches turns to crap, and you know, only the private sector is efficient. And of course, we know it's not true. We have huge examples of private sector inefficiency, and we have good examples of governance that works. So I think we just have to talk about it. I mean, a lot of the way the myths got per perpetrated were through talk, right? Public relations, advertising, marketing campaigns. I mean, you saw the advertisement for free market electricity, right? I mean, a lot of that was done just through words and images. So I think we have to do the same thing. We have to talk about it, and we have to say, wait, hold on. You know, we've, we've been buying into a set of ideologies for a while that aren't actually true. And we could have a different conversation. Um, how many of you wrote, uh, watched the television show Mad Men? So, yeah, so I, do you remember the episode that was the Lucky Strike episode where Don Draper finally rejects the Lucky Strike account and gets into big trouble for that? But when that episode came out, I must have got 500 emails saying, Naomi, you have to watch this episode, right? Because it was really all about the question of what was the message going to be. And um, there's a subsequent episode where Peggy says to Don, you know, she was not comfortable about something that was being said in a meeting. And Don says to her, if you don't like what's being said, change the conversation. And I thought, oh, God, those writers are so smart, right? So I think it's, it's up to us to change the conversation. And there are a lot of myths out there that we've been buying into because we don't know what the alternative is or we don't know what the truth is or we don't know what else to say. So I don't really like to talk about collective action because for a lot of people that sounds like communism, right? But I think we can talk about the common good, right? And almost everybody has some notion of the common good from their communities, their schools, their churches, their synagogues, their mosques, their universities. I mean, what is a university if not an institution dedicated to some notion of common good? So that's what I like to talk about and to say, you know, we have choices. We have technologies that we can choose among. And maybe for some communities, a microgrid approach is the better one, but for others, you know, an integrated grid is better. I mean, I don't think you're going to get microgrids to work in New York City, right? But you can imagine it working in a lot of other places. So I just think we have to change the conversation. Uh, hello. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. I think um, your words are really enlightening. Um, so my question um, involves more of a social aspect. 
Um, something I've encountered when talking to people who either um, are skeptical about climate change or just um, is, is kind of the apathy. So there's kind of two parts to it. One is that like they they understand the science and the phenomena of climate change, and um, but they just uh, deny its relevance. So they're kind of more fatalistic about it, and um, so that's kind of hard to approach. And secondly, some people just don't prioritize it as much. So things like um, social issues like immigration or race relations or abortion come first. So I was wondering if you had any advice in terms of how to approach those kinds of conversations um, and make climate change more more relevant to um, everyday people who just yeah care more about social issues. So. Sure, that's a great question. So I have two responses to that. The first one is really George's message, right? That we haven't done a good job in really communicating why climate change matters to us, to our communities, our people, our children. Um, and we have the scientific community, I think, has for too long talked about it as something that's far away in time and space. So I do think that talking about the way climate change is impacting us now in terms of sea level rise, well, Missouri, that might not be the best example, but you know, um, effects on storms or drought, I mean, obviously agricultural impacts here in Missouri are very important. Talking about things that people can already see happening around them that makes it real for them, I think that's terribly important. I don't quite agree that we shouldn't talk about polar bears, so I didn't quite agree with the slide that was like not polar bears, yes, the child with asthma. I think it's both ends. There are a lot of people who care about polar bears. The polar bear is the canary in the coal mine of climate change. And I think it's a very powerful signal, symbol for many people because many people do understand that it's not just about the polar bear. It's what the polar bear represents, the canary in the coal mine metaphor, right? And also a lot of people really love polar bears, myself included. And I should say while we're on the subject of sports, I don't really do too well with sports analogies. I have to confess I'm more of a hiking, skiing, climbing kind of person than an NCAA March Madness. But my daughter plays field hockey for NCAA Division III Bowdoin College, who um, came second in the nation this year, shameless plug, uh, for the polar bears. And their mascot is the polar bears. We are the polar bears. So I have a polar bear pin, and I do wear it a lot because it's my sports mascot. And the reality is whenever I wear my Bowdoin polar bear pin, people always think I'm wearing it because of climate change, which is OK too, right? Lots of people love polar bears. So we don't have to give up on polar bears. It's not either or. And I, I, and I actually think this is important. It's not just rhetorical. For too long, we've talked about the environment, and we've let other people frame this as an issue of the environment versus people, you know, polar bears versus the child with asthma. And that's just the wrong framing, right? Because if we take seriously the ecological messages that Wes was talking about and uh, other people, the planet is our home, right? This is our house, and we are burning down our house, right? So when we talk about protecting the environment, we're talking about protecting ourselves and our home. And this is actually the most powerful message of the Papal Encyclical on Climate Change and Inequality, which if you haven't read, I strongly recommend. And you don't have to read the Melville Press edition that I wrote the introduction to. Um, so this is what the Pope says, right? The Pope says it's not either or. You know, and he says when Christians say, you know, I care about people, not the environment, he says this is a mistaken interpretation of Christian theology. That's an incredibly powerful message, right? Because lots and lots of people, including a lot of religious people, actually do think it's, oh, I care about the environment, but I care about people more. I mean, I've heard people say that so many times, right? Well, I mean, we are the environment. The environment is us. So to the extent that we can reject that dichotomy, it gets back to your question of how to talk about it, we're all interconnected, right? That's the message of, you know, 100 years of scientific study in ecology. If we damage the environment, we damage ourselves. I almost hate to ask another question after that. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, I'm hi. Sarah Shipley Hiles. I teach yeah. in the journalism school here, and I'm so glad that you're here. And like Catherine, you know, we talk about this all the time: false balance problem. Um, but I think a lot of journalists who have lived through this era now understand the false balance problem and have done a lot to get away from it. But I'm curious, from your perspective, do you think that that has happened? Mm. Do you see the evidence that that has happened in the media? Do you still see? Um, skeptics slash naysayers, whatever you want to call them, getting airtime or ink. And um, do you have any thoughts for the media on how to approach the issue in, in a not politicized way, mm. in a way that people who, so you're not preaching to the choir of people who already believe that we should be doing something or that we should care about it? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? 
Yeah, it's a good question, and I'm not the expert. You are, so <laughs> um, my tendency is to want to throw it back to you, but I'll just answer the first part at least. Um, I definitely think it is better. I mean, I certainly see reading the press. It's not nearly as bad as it used to be. I still think it's not entirely cured. I mean, I've heard, said journalists say to me, oh, we don't do that anymore, and then like two days later I see. And it's not as egregious. It's not like when Max Boykoff, the Boykoffs, Max and Jules, did their study about balance in the immediate, right? They showed it was like practically 50-50, even though the science was, you know, 97-3 or 99-1. Um, I think it's like a lot better now, but you still see that like the New York Times giving a few sentences. And I actually did challenge a New York Times reporter one time recently. I think it was when AR5 came out and he, had, he was quoting Fred Singer. And I said, why are you quoting Fred Singer? I mean, we've exposed this guy. We know he's a fraud. We know he's a shill. We know he's ideologically driven. You know, what more do you need? And he says, well, it's only two sentences. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but you don't give two sentences to my housekeeper, and she's more informed on this issue than Fred Singer is, you know? I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, at some point you have to say, he doesn't deserve any sentences, right? And he's a self-proclaimed deserver, right? But he's not. So I do think it's much better, but I still think there's some, some you know, work to be done. And uh, the second question I think I throw back to you to take to your students to talk about. <laughs> Hi, this is such a uh, great thought-provoking conversation. I'm with Show Me Solar, and we advocate for uh, renewable energy in Missouri. Thank you. And um, the, r the real entrenched political opposition, I believe, across the United States is coming from the um, fossil fuel and nuclear power um, industry and where they really have a stranglehold is in so many states of which Missouri is one where power generation is not part of the free market at all right and right. and the real myth probably maybe that is crystallizing in my mind as as you talk is that that is the real hoax that is being foisted upon the American public is that, yeah, that power generation as we, as it currently exists in most states as part of the free market enterprise, if only it were. And I think that it's, it sounds like in the states where it in fact is, where um, private companies are allowed to generate solar power and wind power that the fossil fuel and the nuclear power industries are going down. They're, they're losing um, their grip on, on the industry. But Missouri, for example, is a state where the Public Service Commission has blocked high voltage power lines from the Great Plains states from coming through the state and bringing their, their clean, low cost energy to Missouri and through Missouri to states farther farther east, and the um, the solar industry that was launched by a um, a voter ballot initiative that established solar rebates for the industry and launched it back in 2010. The rebates started, and the industry was beginning to grow exponentially. And by the end of 2013 the investor-owned utilities shut down the solar <laughs> rebates in the state, and the solar industry's been in free fall ever since. Yeah, well, I think this is an incredibly important issue, so thank you for raising it, and thank you for your work. I think this is a perfect place where citizens' mobilization could make play a big role, and you could get a lot of people who might not otherwise put climate change high on their list of priorities because they're actually being denied the opportunity to generate clean, green, low-cost, renewable energy. And I think you could have some good political slogans about, you know, freeing the energy market. <laughs> you know, let's have a free market that would tap into actually a lot of conservatives' beliefs that we should have competition in the marketplace. And competition is being suppressed now, as you say, uh, by the utilities. And this is happening in a lot of places around the country. Um, when we were making the film of Merchants of Doubt, you know, it was really great to work with Robbie Kenner because he's a very, very professional documentarian, and he's a person who knows how to make serious documentary films that are also entertaining 
and can reach a mass market. And so we were very happy to work with someone who had that kind of expertise so we wouldn't just make a documentary that would only be seen you know, by people who are already members of the citizens' climate lobby. But there was one decision he made that I didn't like. And uh, we had some film clippage of this woman, Debbie Dooley. And if you could get her to come visit, you really sh should. She's from Arkansas, so she's nearby. And um, I do know where Arkansas is. And uh, by the way, I meant to say earlier, I have no connection to Georgia, just for the record. <laughs> but I do have a connection to Missouri. 30 years ago, I did some consulting work for a mining company out of, you know, working out of Rolla on the Pea Ridge and Pilot Knob iron deposits. So just to let you know that, that's better than a Georgia connection. Anyway, um, but Debbie Dooley was from Arkansas, and she was a member of the Green Tea Party. And the Green Tea Party was pushing for um, solar power adoption. Oh, maybe it was Georgia, actually. No, maybe it was Georgia. I do have a Georgia connection. OK, well, it was either Georgia or Arkansas. I'm sorry, but you can find out. Anyway, Debbie Dooley is this amazing, wonderful gal. And she was saying, look, the Koch brothers are trying to block solar power in our state. They don't represent the interests of ordinary people. The Tea Party has got this wrong. And so she joined the Green Tea Party that was fighting for essentially free markets in energy. And um, I thought she was terrific. I just adored her. And then she got cut out of the film. That footage got cut out. And I asked Robbie, I said, why did you cut that out? And he said, well, we did a focus group. And people didn't like Debbie. They thought she was shrill. I go, oh, no. So anyway, invite Debbie to come next year and talk about her work. Because I think that kind of grassroots mobilization by ordinary citizens who are starting to get it, that the utilities represent a very certain interest in this country. Uh, they're very tightly controlled by relatively small numbers of people. And right now, they're mostly protecting their existing structures. Their ex and there's also this baseload issue comes up, too. A lot of them have contracts with nuclear or gas or coal-fired power plants. And they're contractually obligated to buy certain amounts of power from those suppliers. So if you now start feeding a lot of renewables into the grid, that actually creates a problem for them. So that's a legitimate question, but that should be something that's debated openly in public hearings to say, OK, well, how do we move this forward? Because remember, these are public utilities, although they don't behave like they are. And they were granted regulated monopolies on the grounds that electricity wasn't actually a logical place for a free market competition. And you know, those, those are the arguments that were being made in the 1920s. And now we're in a different place in history, in a different moment. And we need to revisit some of the assumptions about how our electricity grid is managed, how our utilities are run. And I think it's going to happen, but I think we need a lot more pressure from the public demanding that the utilities, you know, that the public utility commissions have these conversations. So we'll take two more questions. What would you say about Naomi Klein's book, the other Naomi? Oh, uh, sorry, where's the question coming from? Oh, there. Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, I think it's an incredibly well-written book. Um, I'm very jealous of the way she writes. She has an amazingly vivid and lively writing style. And I also never like to say anything bad about another Naomi. <laughs> So um, I think it's an important book. I think she's raised a lot of really, really important questions. And I really like the way she integrates the economic, the environmental, and the social issues. I, I agree with all of that. The place where I diverge from her is sort of twofold. So you know, what she basically says is that you know, we have to abandon ca capitalism, right? That this is capitalism. You know, we have to get rid of capitalism. When I first heard her talk about that, I actually had this sort of sinking feeling. I thought, oh, no. That's exactly what Bill Nuremberg thought, right? He thought this is just an excuse to bring in socialism by the back door. So when she says we need socialism, for me, that kind of affirms everything that these people you know, think is true of environmentalists and environmental scientists. So you know, it, my initial reaction to it is, oh, please, you really have to say that. You know? But that said, you know, she's obviously entitled to her opinion and her interpretation. So then the question becomes, you know, do we really have to abandon capitalism and just have a completely different economic system? And my view of that is sort of twofold. If she's right, then I feel a sense of despair. Because I feel like to say we have to change the entire economic system just seems like you know, an impossible task. And I don't know if you saw, there was a review in the New York Times of her book together with mine and a third book. And it was a review of my new book, The Collapse of Western Civilization, which is a work of fiction. And the reviewer said, well, and the other two books were nonfiction. So one was Naomi Klein's, the other was this woman, Diane Ackerman, um, who's a kind of techno fideist and says it'll all be fine. Technology will solve all our problems. Uh, so the reviewer said, well, two of these books are, are nonfiction. One is fictional, but the fictional account seems more like the truth. 
you know? And he said, Naomi Klein's book reads like a manifesto for a presidential candidate who has exactly zero possibility of getting elected in the United States. So I guess I, I feel like her, her prescription for the solution just feels like such a gigantic lift that if she's right, then I actually sort of feel like it's hopeless. And that might be wrong on my part to say that, but it is how I feel. But perhaps more factually and empirically based, I also don't think it's right. I don't think it's true. And that's partly why I've become interested in this question of what is going on in the private sector right now. And I think we're seeing a lot of changes already happening, but we do need some adjustments in the system to make, to facilitate the large-scale adaptation. And so my view is, it's a kind of adaptive management view. My view is, let's get a, put a price on carbon. We could start with $20 a ton like Alberta, and let's see where it gets us. And it may get us quite far, right? And if we could just get a few of these key things in place, like demand response pricing, grid integration, these are still significant challenges, but they're not unimaginable, right? The US government built a grid once, it could do it again. We have heavy taxation on tobacco, we could do that for carbon. So I see those as manageable and achievable goals, and goals that actually lots of conservatives in principle actually ought to support, because pricing carbon makes sense and lots of conservatives, in fact, do support it, like Hank Paulson, who we heard about earlier today, or Bob Inglis. So my view is we should do those things that are kind of within our grasp, and if 10 years from now, if we achieve those things and we see it's really not enough and we need something bigger and more dramatic, then okay, then I'd say then we have to swing for the fences. But if we can do it with a more modest intervention, that just strikes me as you know, more sensible and more achievable and less depressing, because if I really think I have to change the entire system, well, you know, good luck with that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? We have one more question, gentleman in the red right here. I, I, I'd like to go back to the, the graph that showed the 59%, uh, it was like an 11% increase in uh, Republican right. voters who believe that climate change is occurring. And right. the, I guess the question I have is when you look at national politics, it seems like anybody that is in the Republican Party says that if they acknowledge the fact that it's occurring or or, or, or that uh, man-made climate change is occurring, they're not going to be in office very long. And so h h how do you reconcile the fact that they're, vo they're saying this and the voters are, I, I, there seems to be a, a discrepancy. Well, we know, we know what the answer to that question is. So it's about the difference between the leadership and the rank and file, right? And that was partly why I did my 2004 study, right? Because one of the things we know from history and sociology is what leadership says and does and what rank and file say and do and want are not necessarily the same. So what this shows us is that ordinary Republicans, 60% in polls called in the privacy of their own homes say that yes, they think climate change is occurring. But two things, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're prepared to take action against it, right? And what the polls also show is that when you ask Republicans about solutions, depending on how you frame it, you get very, very different answers. So if you say, you know, are you willing to, do you believe that we should pay the true cost of fossil fuels? People will say yes. If you say, are you willing to pay $500 more for your car? People will say no, <laughs> right? So a lot of it depends on how it's framed. But the other big disconnect, is who's controlling the leadership. And what we know is that the fossil fuel industry, the Koch brothers, have spent huge amounts of money to target any Republican who even suggests that he or she might be amenable to doing something about climate. They become targets. And in the film, we talk about this because this is what happened to Bob Inglis. So Bob Inglis was, as he puts it, one of the most conservative Republicans from one of the most conservative districts in one of the most conservative states in America, South Carolina, and he had the seat that's now held by Trey Gowdy, who you may remember was the person who ran the most recent Benghazi hearings. Um, he was on the House Science Committee. He learned about the scientific evidence. He also started hearing about it from his own son at home at the dinner table, who was taking an environmental science class at college, so proving that what we do in universities does make a difference. And, um, he started to realize that this was a real issue, and he started to speak about it in public. And he didn't even advocate for any solution. He just started to say, look, I think this is a real problem, and we have to talk about it. And he was targeted by the Tea Party, and he lost his seat. And as we show in the film clip, he went down to a crushing defeat. I mean, he was crushed. And he has partly become an advocate for 
talking to conservatives and Republicans about climate change because of his personal experience. And he's a very courageous and brave man, and he didn't let that defeat stop him. It, it kind of gave him a new activity in life. But most people are not prepared to risk that, right? And you see about even someone like John McCain, who used to be a leader on climate change. I mean, McCain realizes that when he, well, when he wanted to be president, right, he realized that his chances of getting the nomination would disappear if he tried to do what Bob Inglis had done in South Carolina. So there's this tremendous financial and political pressure on the Republican leadership. And now I think they're kind of backed into a corner. And I think there are definitely people in the Republican Party who realize that, you know, as Bobby Jindal famously put it, they should stop being the party of stupid. And, you know, for a while it looked like maybe that was going to happen here. And you see it in John Kasich, right? I mean, the poor man, I actually feel really sorry for John Kasich, right? He's trying to be reasonable, you know? He's trying to be like a rational human being. And he says in public, well, yes, there's climate change. But then, like, two weeks later, he says, well, I'm not really sure. And then the latest thing he goes, he goes, renewables are too darn expensive, right? Did you see that one? It's like, no, they're actually not too expensive. Fossil fuels are too expensive, right? Fossil fuels are going to cost us trillions of dollars in, in external costs. And anyway, by the way, also when you talk to your colleagues and friends, the World Bank has subsidies to fossil fuel production around the globe. Anyone want to take a guess what that number might be? $700 billion. And that's a very nice number and easy and good to remember because it's the same amount of money that was put into the TARP fund, the Troubled Assets Recovery Program, that bailed out the banks. And this is $700 billion every single year. So we, the taxpayers, are bailing out the fossil fuel companies, right? And fossil, this tells us fossil fuel companies are troubled assets, right? So we need to be talking a lot more about that. Now, that's the global figure, $700 billion. Uh, MIT study a couple of years ago in the United States Subsidies for fossil fuels outpace subsidies for renewables 10 to 1. So one thing you can just say to your neighbors and friends, well, why don't we just stop subsidizing fossil fuels and have a genuine free market? Let's have a level playing field. And that alone would make a huge difference to the renewable industry. And that's a message that at least some Republicans are prepared to hear. Why? You know, what is it going to take to break the stranglehold on the leadership? I don't know. You might have thought that Hank Paulson would have had more impact. In California, um, Schultz, the former Secretary of Defense, I always get confused between Charles Schultz and George Schultz. George Schultz, Charles Schultz is the peanuts guy, right? George Schultz um, played a big role kind of behind the scenes in helping to pass AB 32, the climate law in California. There are a lot of good Republicans in California. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a great leader on this issue in California, actually. There are a lot of people in Silicon Valley. So it's happening in places around the country, but you know, this stranglehold on the leadership in DC is very bad. So my response to that is work on the state level. You know, there's a lot of good things happening in states right now. And in most states, it's easier to influence your legislators than it is to influence your congressmen. So that's where I see kind of points of hope right now is on the state level. In Massachusetts, uh, we got legislation introduced last year to have carbon pricing in Massachusetts. And at first, it didn't look like it was going anywhere. But now they've had two sets of hearings. It's getting discussed. Citizens Climate Lobby is doing a good job in Massachusetts. So there's, you know, there's signs of movement, but it's just not happening fast enough. Well, thanks. We've run to the end of the symposium. Thanks so much for coming. We hope you come next year. And let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.